So as disciples, as the disciples were wondering what it meant to follow in those days after Easter, we too step into each day aware that we have a witness and a wonder that we too can bring. And so as we prepare to come into worship, as we welcome those who are worshiping online with us or at other times of the week, a couple pieces of announcements to just remember. Our WOW women are gathering this Wednesday night at the Urban Cellar in West Des Moines. Five o'clock for appetizers and fellowship, six o'clock for supper. All women are welcome to join together for that uh, special time. We also have important word about our witness and our worship outside the walls at Spurgeon Manor at the end of the month. And there'll be more information sent out um, via email and the newsletter update as well as uh, the Facebook page and the website for more information about that ministry, the 29th, the last Sunday of the month. And just reminders that the craft uh, show, vendor show, is the first weekend in June, so lots of things coming up. But it is not the activities or the calendar that brings us together. It is our witness and worship, the opportunity to praise God and to be reminded of the good news. And so as we come together today, let us take a moment to set aside those things that maybe have filled our minds uh, with calendar events and to-do lists and, and special things that lay ahead and challenges that have gone before. Let's set those aside as together we focus and center and open ourselves for the good news that God has for us today. And let us do so as together we prepare for worship as we listen to our prayer.
Good morning. Our reading today is Psalm 23rd, the 23rd Psalm, excuse me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life. Let us join together in prayer. God of life and love, we give you thanks for this new day. We give you thanks for the rain and the restorative power it has to cleanse and to nourish your creation. We're grateful, O oh God, for all the ways your presence is made known to us in great and small ways. Ways that we are reminded of your steadfast love for us and for all people. On this day, as we gather in worship to celebrate your love, we give you thanks for those who have given us life. Though we often think about you as a parent, our Creator, one who loves us and sustains us, we also know that there are many in our lives who have done the same. We give you praise, O oh God, for the gift of your love and the gift of motherly love, both gentle and fierce, strong and humble, kind and true. We give you thanks for those that have been our mothers, and those who have been like our mothers, those who are still on earth, and those who have joined you in life everlasting. <clears throat> so on this day, we give thanks for mothers who work day and night to raise and care for their children. We remember those mothers who labor at this task alone. Help us as your church to be active in ways that we might uphold all families and assist those who need help and encouragement and companionship on the journey. We know, O oh God, that even on the night that your son was on the cross, his mother Mary wept. We know that there are mothers who have lost children to death and must, must carry on, and we ask that you would be with them in their grief. For those women who are new mothers and are expecting the birth of a child sometime in this next year and so are not quite mothers yet but are so excited, we give you thanks for the joy and the anticipation of new life, for the gift that comes with those possibilities in that new life. We know, O oh God, that this Mother's Day is a day that is hard for those who have longed for and prayed for and wished for children of their own and never have been able to. Many of these women have been examples in our lives of love and grace and ways to follow in your ministry and your call as they have nurtured and cared for others. May their sadness be met with our expressions of love and thanks. And we pray for not only the children of mothers who have maybe not lived up to all that we might hope that they could have, but also those that feel their own failings ever so strongly. We believe you are a God of healing, and that we all need to stand 
front of you and ask for grace and mercy. God, where we cannot forgive, give us strength and know that you can give it to all. We like to think, O oh God, of Mother's Day as days of flowers and lunches and brunches and presents. Lounging around in slippers and bathrobes. We know this day around the world there are mothers who are watching their children die of hunger. That are digging their children out of the bombed wreckage of school buildings, apartment buildings. That are witnessing the massacring of children, not only in the name of war, but in the name of searches for power money and greed. So we give you thanks for our mothers and the women who have been mothers for us. We give thanks for the mothers we will never know personally, the mothers that have come before and the mothers that will come after, and all of those who have borne your light and your world and are now and will be someday part of the great cloud of witnesses. In your name we worship, in your name we pray, in your name we give thanks. Amen. <clears throat> As we continue to explore our question of how do we share our faith outside our walls, we are at week three. Week one, we looked at sharing our praise and how we can work towards giving voice to the reason we're thankful for all the things around us, the gifts of God. And last week, we jumped into the question of how has our faith transformed us? How have we been changed by our relationship with God? And then how can we tell people about it? This week, we're going to look at the third topic of faith that we can each be sharing outside of our walls, the ways that we have experienced the presence of God. Now, I'm not sure if there are too many scripture verses more well-known than the 23rd Psalm. How many of you have had to memorize that in a Sunday school class at one point? How many of you could still get through the whole thing? Bet you a lot of you, right? It's a lot. There's a lot in it. It tells us a lot. It, it shows us a lot. It reminds us a lot about how God relates to us along life's journey. Now, I titled today's sermon, You Are With Me, as a kind of a dual purpose title. The first was to give us our challenge for today to begin to tell our story of how God has been with us. But the second reason was also to make reference to our other emphasis of today, Mother's Day, and the role that important women have played in our lives in support and direction and challenge and care throughout the years. Now, I'm not going to preach a traditional Mother's Day sermon today, but I know that for many, this image of the shepherd caring for us from Psalm 23 is one that many associate with the women who helped to raise them into the adults that they are today. And for good reason. We are a lot like sheep. There's much about our living our lives that we would fail spectacularly at without guidance from a shepherd, right? Paths that we would take that would be dangerous and harmful. Things we might try to eat. Uh, distance from the herd that we might wander, obstacles we might get stuck upon, or fences we might stick our heads through and not be able to get them out of. All of these things that could cause us harm. All of these things that a shepherd helps their sheep to avoid. Luckily, we're a lot less dirty, and we smell a smidge better than sheep. But we also, don't we, benefit from the gift of God's presence with us in similar ways. 
So I want us today to use this text as, as a way of remembering how God is with us so that we might not only see it more clearly, but share it more often. So our text today starts out with, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now we know, of course, by this point in time in our lives, that this does not mean that if we follow God that all will be easy and perfect. But we know that it is true that if God is our shepherd and we follow God's instructions and guidance, we will find compassion and care and support even in those tough times. We will find what we need. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. God wants for us peace and hope and joy in life. God calls us to places that restore us and heal us. God brings us to places in our spirit and our soul that are flat water. Not crashing rapids, not breaking waves. Places where the water is flat and calm, where our souls and our spirits might rest. Now a really important one right here, kind of in that first half. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. God as a shepherd will not walk us into temptation and wrongdoing. God may lead us into some dangerous situations where justice or mercy or peace must be proclaimed in settings that are quite the opposite settings that are dangerous and fraught with risk. God may say, as my child, you will go and bear my good news, be a witness to the gospel message. But God will not call us into evil. Now maybe my favorite part, I don't know about yours, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. Some say, and I remember learning it as a kid, even though I walk through the valley of death, that's the translation that I learned as a kid, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Much the same as God won't call us into temptation, God will not abandon us when we go forth bearing God's witness. No matter how terrifying, no matter how hard, no matter how confusing, God will not leave us. The rod and the staff, right? The, the markers, the images, the physical representation of the ruler's power will go with us. We will, we will be able to claim those and hold those, bringing us confidence and courage and comfort that God has not set us out alone. Now, my least favorite part. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. I was all with this text till that point in time. I wanted it to be God will smite your enemies. God will keep you separate from those who wish you harm. God will, will keep you away from those that don't agree and challenge you. No, God will set a place before you at the table of your enemies. It means God will also challenge us. Even when we're sent out full of confidence and courage, God is going to be challenging us to practice and to live the call given to us even when that means sitting at the same table with our enemies, with our hardest challenge, whatever that challenge is. So picture that table, right? You're seated. That biggest challenge, that, that biggest obstacle is across the table from you. You are, you are seated there and you have no option but to confront it the next part of that, though, is 
I will anoint your head with oil and your cup will overflow. We're sitting here at the table and God's anointing oil is dripping down through our hair and our cup in front of us is so full that it's, it's just pouring over onto the table in a ginormous pool. You see, God will even during that deepest, darkest moment or that biggest, most challenging obstacle, God will consecrate us for that challenge. God will anoint us for the calling. God will give us even more than we can take. Our cup will continue to overflow. Overall, it sounds pretty good, though, doesn't it? There's a reason why this text has risen to one that we learn and we share and we use so often. But what do we do with it? Where do we go with it after our hearing? I want to suggest that what we do with it is to learn to trust. Learn to take the praise that we talked about in week one and carry it into each situation we encounter. Not only as a reminder of what God has done in the past, but also as a proclamation as to what God will do with us yet. That we step into whatever situation we encounter with an attitude that I will not fear for God is with me. That on the other side, I know I will find still water. It's just that we take from this a preparedness that even though it seems like it's going to be a really hard task, that we are going to be able to overcome it, that we will find our place in that challenge, that we will be led in those right paths, and our cup will overflow. No matter what happens next, Suppose we take away from this an awareness and an openness to all the things that we've been given, all the things we give God thanks for, all the praise that we've been offering to God, all the celebrations and the confessions and the witnesses that remind us and uphold us and push us then to, into the face of whatever challenges that good news that we know. to see if that trust can send us out to find and to see and to share the ways that God has been with us. You all know we can walk through the valley of the shadow of death and fear no evil. You know that. But do you trust that? Once we trust it, we can proclaim it like the psalmist. And then when we live outside of the walls of the church, outside of the walls that we have built to protect us and keep us isolated, the walls that we use as an excuse, as a reason, as a barrier, if we trust, then we can move through those paths that God leads us, proclaiming that Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. This week's anthem is one that I first heard the summer at the end of my sixth grade year. Now, I went to school, many of you don't know this, I went to school in the sixth grade as part of an environmental education program that was in my town in Grand Rapids, Michigan. So I went to school every day at the zoo. 
we learned all kinds of awesome things and all of our lessons were situated within that context. And one of the highlights of the end of our school year was that we would go on a five day camping and canoeing and hiking trip as a school. So on my sixth grade trip, we had two of the young men that were counseling my portion of, of my class. And of course, you know, they were awesome. Young adult men, cool as could be as far as I was concerned. One played the guitar at night around the campfire and the other had brought his bongos <laughs> and would play with him. They sang a song I had never heard before. They sang a song about finding courage in the midst of the valley and choosing to find the presence of the good in every challenge, the confidence that there was a way to choose our response, to claim the goodness that follows us, to trust that we too can overcome. A song that, like our theme in these anthems, broke through from the world outside of church and my faith and stood right in front of me and said, yes, this is what God does for you. I'm sure many of you know this song, but let us hear it again as a reminder that indeed God is with you. Thank mm -hmm. you. and a variety of ways that we see God around us. 
we are reminded of God's presence with us, that we can talk about how God has walked beside us. And as we gather in worship, we spend the time and we invite the opportunity to share where and how you have seen God at work in your life. And I invite you, if you have a God sighting, to share it at this time, if you feel so called. As Lori does. A very dear friend and co-worker of mine this week, <clears throat> excuse me, just was blessed with a second little grandson. And this is her second grandbaby, and her oldest one is 11. And this is the first baby for her other son. And seeing pictures of that brand new baby and the excitement that Miss Laura and I got to share at school together was the most wonderful God sighting and blessing that anyone could be blessed with. Amen. <clears throat> Other God sightings. We were, <clears throat> excuse me, we were sitting out on our uh, fire pit area the other day and watching, watching the birds and we saw two wrens go in our wren house. We've never seen two go in there at the same time. Usually, <laughs> <laughs> it's usually one at a time, but this time two wrens went in there so it's, there's a, a good chance that we are going to have a family of wrens later. <laughs> Speaking of birds, my God sighting this morning as uh, I was visiting with somebody standing in the narthex and looked out to the front doors. I saw in our little uh, pot of, of flowers there beside the door a hummingbird coming to feast in those flowers. And I remember fondly the many years spent at the cottage in northern Michigan with our hummingbird feeder hanging outside the door right by grandma's seat. And any time there was a hummingbird, the whole family had to stop what you were doing and pause to watch that hummingbird. It was years later when I visited Costa Rica and had an opportunity to visit a tree that, and uh, the Monteverde Rainforest Preserve that was filled with uh, different types of feeders for hummingbirds and was able to stand with hundreds of hummingbirds flying around. Remembering the gift to pause, to take something that is normal, something that's every day, and to call it sacred and holy, to stop and be aware. And this morning, I was reminded of that gift, reminded of that blessing, Give thanks for that sight of God's presence. Tammy and then Lori. Uh, you mentioned our roof, and you also mentioned the uh, nail that we got in our in our tire. So we had to get a tire chain, you know, get our tire fixed and everything. But we have to remember the blessing that was here and why we got that that uh, nail in the tire. <laughs> so. If we can remember the nails that were pounded yes. on Easter and the good that came from that. Amen. And then Lori had something too. I don't think I need the microphone. Okay. You're saying we paused and enjoyed the hummingbird this morning. It takes me back to the morning that you and I and Erica ran there at the, uh, the windows and she drove our attention to that beautiful, beautiful sunset mm -hmm. that day. So beautiful to stop. So thank you, Miss Erica, for sharing that with us that day. We share the good news of our gifts, of our, the ways that we have seen God at work in our lives as preparation for our coming to the table, preparation for our responding to Christ's invitation to come to eat and to drink and to gather in His presence and in His invitation. 
And so as together we prepare to come to the communion table, let us sing together our communion hymn, Where He Leads Me.
That when we think we have reached the end of what it means for us to be a people of life and faith, that when we think we have reached the end and we just can't seem to find hope anymore, that you are standing there and that you are offering us not a tomb that has a stone rolled in front of it, but one that has been rolled away and that you are standing there saying, come look and see what you thought you found here is no longer. The obstacle is gone. The end has been washed away. Come. Live with me and walk with me. So we give you thanks, O oh God, as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup. That you are reminding us and calling us back. Back to that gift that your son gave his disciples that night in the upper room. Back to the welcome. To go make fishers of men to stand up and walk because we are healed. So we gather at this table and we pray together the prayer that your son taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus gathered with his disciples in the upper room. He took a loaf of bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, Take and eat, for this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in a like manner he took the cup and he poured it and he passed it amongst them saying, Take and drink of this each one of you, for this cup is my blood which is poured out for you. Drink of it in remembrance of me. All are welcome at Christ's invitation to come to eat and to drink. You are invited to come down the center aisle to receive the gift of the body of Christ, to drink from the cup of salvation. And come, let us eat and drink together. <laughs> 